Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Mount Vernon United Methodist Church online worship service. The gospel message is full of the good news of love, not just any love, but the love of the everlasting God. God is inviting us to proclaim the gospel in our daily life. I'm sure that God will give us courage and strength to proclaim the gospel. I pray that God may grant peace healing, and comfort to each one of us through this worship service. Let us worship God with joyful noise. I just have one announcement today. The mailing address given in the February newsletter for Tristan Woodard was incomplete. So please call us or email the church office for his complete mailing address. Uh, we uh, uh, send email to uh, we we sent a group email to everyone um, w along with Tristan's complete e uh, mailing address. So you may find his mailing address in the email. Will you join me in call to worship? Praise God who has showed us with love. Even in the dark times, God protects and guides us. God has blessed us with a magnificent world. If strife should assail, God call us to be people of healing and action to help others. Come, let us worship God who is always with us. Let us praise God that through all our trials and triumphs, God's love brings us hope. Amen. <laughs> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. 
salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Bears the on eagle's wings, air in his keeping sustaining. God's care enfolds all whose true good he upholds. Hast thou not known his sustaining? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Praise to the Lord who doth nourish thy life and restore thee, fitting thee well for the tasks that are ever before thee. Then to thy need, God as a mother doth speed, spread grace o'er thee. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. That hath life and breath, come now with praises before him. Let the The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 29 to verse 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In today's passage from Mark's gospel, Jesus' ministry took place in Galilee. Galilee was a region in northern Israel, on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 21 says that Jesus and the disciples enter the city of Capernaum, which was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. 
when the, when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and taught there. And people were amazed by his teaching. Jesus taught with authority. People had never heard teaching like that. In the synagogue, Jesus met a man with unclean spirit. And Jesus cast out the unclean spirit. And after this happened, Jesus and the disciples went to the house of Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. There, Jesus did something amazing. Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law, who was in bed with fever. It's interesting to see how Mark is making a quick transition from one place to another. Jesus was in the synagogue. Then in Mark's words, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Here we see two most important places for the Jews, the synagogue and the home. Synagogue is a place for Jewish people to pray, meet, and learn. And it was an important and sacred place for Jewish communities. The home was probably their second vital space. It was a meeting space for family and relatives, a privileged place for the community. Jesus didn't just stay in the synagogue in order to gain more popularity or fame. He went to a sacred place for the everyday people. The Son of God, the God who was clothed in a human body, entered the house of average people like Simon and Andrew. I think that this may speak to many of us who are worshiping in our home these days. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed how we worship. We used to gather at Mount Vernon and we shared meals together. We worshiped together. We attended our Sunday school classes. We really miss coming to the church. We miss taking communion together. But everything has changed now. What does this passage try to tell us? Our Most High God can help us to feel His presence even when we worship in our own home. God can enter our place. God can make our place sacred and holy. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. God knows our pain. God hears our prayer. God knows our need. And God knows our desire to worship Him. So let us worship Him with all our heart. God will reign over our place. This healing event described in Mark was beautiful because it happened in a home. It certainly reflects the earliest Christian communities, which were house churches. Their church took place in their own living room or kitchen. It was a vital place for them. One scholar says, home churches were missionary platforms, a welcome place for the itinerant preachers, and they provided economic support for the growing movement. Now, isn't that amazing? The Christian entity we know began its movement in daily life, in Christian homes. This reminds us that we can also participate in the growing movement. This is the beauty of God's work. His work will keep expanding and bear more fruits in our own lives. Christian education or Christian discipleship can take place in our own homes. When we and our children watch the godly play lessons our very home becomes the missionary platform. It can be a sacred place for our children. 
They will hear the story of God even in the godly play Zoom meetings. God will be there with us and our children. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Jesus did not settle down at Simon's home after he healed Simon's mother-in-law. Well, Peter and the disciples wanted Jesus to stay. Jesus rejected their proposal. In the middle of night, he went out to pray in solitude. Jesus did not come to the world to satisfy one particular group's interest. He was sent to teach people God's will with authority, to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to be a friend with the outsiders. Jesus couldn't be locked into one place. Jesus' work, God's work, is and always will be expanding to other places. In verse 38, Jesus said, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. His mission work didn't just stay in Capernaum. His mission work expanded into the region of Galilee and even Jerusalem. His good news of hope is and always will reach out to different places around the world. Now, before Jesus went to another town, he left Peter's house and went to a deserted place to pray. Despite, of, despite a full day of ministry, Jesus got up the next morning very early. Some scholars think that Jesus got up before daybreak, about 4 a.m., and that's pretty early. He went to a solitary place, a remote place. There, he spent time praying. It's interesting to see that Jesus had been faced faced with a crowd who were anxiously looking for him. Even the disciples, as verse 36 says, hunted for him. Hunted is a strong word. They wanted Jesus' immediate attention. But Jesus withdrew from the Capernaum crowds to wilderness place. Here, Mark Introduce us to Jesus as someone who faithfully prayed. Mark selectively portrayed Jesus at prayer even when the crowds were desperately looking for him. And let's remember here that Jesus gained strength through prayer. Sometimes we may face a similar challenge. Just as the desperate crowds were looking for Jesus, a busy schedule may clamor our, for our attention. We may be caught up with emails and text messages and fixing broken things. And these things demand our attention. But as Jesus did, we can go to God through prayer. Pray in solitude. I like to think of prayer as God's touch. We tend to focus on prayer as an action. How often do we pray? How long should we pray? What words should we say in prayer? But instead, we can focus on God's work within us in prayer. Prayer is like God touching our soul, heart, and mind. God restores our passion, strength, and energy. You know what? God's work will keep expanding within us in prayer. God will pour out more wisdom, strength, and faith when we come to Him and pray before Him. Let God do His work through our prayer. Another thing we see in this account in Mark's gospel is that 
Even when Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law, he didn't just say the words. Jesus touched her. Mark says, Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lift her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. Jesus touched the sick person and the fever went away. Jesus' healing was like none other. Jesus healed her completely, instantly, and restored full strength. Her fever never came back. She didn't feel better eventually. She felt better instantly. Then she began to serve. The sickness prevented her from doing her daily work. She couldn't enjoy the time with her family. She couldn't enjoy doing things that she liked to do because of her her illness. Her daily life was dominated by illness. Dealing with illness is a really difficult thing. Usually people still feel weak, even after a fever has gone. Maybe they need to eat chicken soup or other food to regain their full strength. This was the power of Jesus' touch, his healing grace. Jesus can instantly restore our faith, love, and passion. Jesus came to Simon's house to show that he wanted to come near the sick so that he could touch them. His touch brought wholeness to the sick people. As we hear in verse 31, then the fever left her and she began to serve them. Simon's mother-in-law began to serve right after Jesus touched her and healed her. When Simon's mother-in-law received the gift of Jesus' healing work, she started to serve Jesus and others with thankfulness and love. She became a true servant and disciple of Jesus. As she overcame the sickness, She overcame selfishness. She offered her gift to others with thankfulness. Well, let's not worry about gender roles and cultural implications in this story. One theologian says, Her service cannot be understood as a woman's menial work under the domination of lazy males. But as a true messianic ministry, creator of Jesus' new family. I love this perspective. Simon's mother-in-law joined Jesus' mission work. No wonder some scholars call her Jesus' first deacon. Amazing. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus touching the sick people. He touched when he healed Jairus' daughter, the blind man, and many more. A couple of months ago, Reverend Ralph Hawkins gave us an illustration of the importance of human touch in his sermon. Scientists have studied this. When infants were left alone without human touch, there were devastating effects on their developmental skills and sociability. Jesus must have understood that the broken ones, the sick, and the outsiders needed his touch to be whole again. These people needed to feel loved again. They needed intimacy and care. Through Jesus' healing ministry, God touched these people. Scholars who study ancient languages draw a close parallel between healing and salvation. Healing and salvation. When Jesus went throughout Galilee and proclaimed the gospel, his words 
touched those who heard his words and received his words with faith, God brought salvation to them. A physician named Richard Selzer has written of the miracle of touch. I'd like to read part of his journal. He said, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies. Her face post-operative, her mouth twisted, palsy, clownish, a tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth has been severed to remove the tumor in her cheek. I had cut the little nerve. The young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamps, lamplight. Isolated from me, private. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. He bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am, I am so close to that. I'm so close that I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate her, to show her that their kiss still works. I hold my breath and let the wonder in. And this is how God's touch works. God sees our suffering and shortcomings. God suffers when we suffer with our own sinful nature. It was God's tears when Jesus cried over Jerusalem. God knew we need his healing touch. When theologian said, theologically speaking, that is a reason for incarnation. God knew the human need for nearness. Jesus is the incarnation of God's love. During Black History Month, maybe we can ponder whether we are participating in God's expanding work and mission. I heard one pastor quote someone's remark on Black History Month. He said, this is not their history. This is our history. One dark night, Martin Luther King Jr. went to the kitchen because he couldn't sleep. His home had been firebombed. His family had received death threats. In the kitchen, he bowed his head over a cup of coffee. He prayed, I'm down here trying to do what's right. But I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. I am afraid. I can't let people see me like this because if they see me weak, they will get weak. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. And he heard a voice saying, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I'll be with you. God touched his soul that night in his prayer. The work of Martin Luther King Jr. is still expanding through people who stand up for justice and love. God's work will never stop. So too, can we be touched to carry on this work? As Jesus headed to the next town to preach and heal, we are heading toward the needy people and community that needs care and love. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please join me in affirmation of faith. Let us read the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the offering. God, you have created the universe. Everything we see has come into being because of you. Your glory is beyond our comprehension. We are thankful for the opportunity to put these gifts to work, proclaiming your gospel of love. We lift up for those who are near and dear to us. Our friends and family members are in need of your healing mercies in compassionate love. You know our needs and concerns before our voices can frame them. Let us accept the love you give to us, Lord. We pray for this nation and the leaders. And also we pray for the health care providers and school teachers and those who are helping our daily life possible. Let the message of hope and compassion go forth from us again to this world, which focus on tragedy and turmoil. And once again, let us know fully that you are with us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory, and pour upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice 
in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as a body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. Until Christ comes in final victory, we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one love, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one love. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The body of Christ given for you. You may take the bread now. The blood of Christ given for you. You may talk, take, take the cup now. And let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now receive the benediction. Renew by the power of God's unconditional love and forgiveness, strengthened by the witness of Jesus to be of service to others. We go from this place rejoicing in the opportunities to serve others in Christ's name. Go in peace, and may the peace of God always dwell within you. Amen.